Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this joint EOL-MQ seminar. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Ulrika Romachka, or Ricky, as she is known to many of us. Dr. Romachka received her PhD in meteorology at the University of Vienna, Austria, and was a research scientist at the University of Washington and the Goethe University Frankfurt in Germany, analyzing trim precipitation radar data. And she has continued her work in radar and precipitation studies here at NCAR. At present, Ulrika is a project scientist at EOL, where she is the lead scientist for the NCAR Hyper Cloud Radar. Among other important responsibilities, such as being the data manager for the remote sensing facility and her ongoing work to improve radar calibration and clutter mitigation of the ground-based S-pole precipitation radar. So it makes sense that her talk today revolves around radars and precipitation and clouds, as you can see from her first slide. In particular, Dr. Romachka will talk about a newly developed algorithm called ECHO, which, is, which stands for Echo Classification from Convectivity, which classifies radar echoes as convective, mixed stratiform, and other subtypes. For those of you watching online, you can type your questions on the Slido inter interface at the bottom of the presentation screen, and we're going to pre present your questions at the end of her seminar. Dr. Romachka, welcome, and the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you, Jackie, for the kind introduction. And thanks to everyone who came here instead of going outside in this beautiful weather. And also thanks for the people online joining. So I'm excited to introduce our new ECHO algorithm today. And I have to say this idea for ECHO was originally Mike Dixon's. And I joined him later on in this effort to make this algorithm um, what it is today. So when we talk about distinguishing convective from stratiform radar echoes, why is that important? So fundamentally, convective and stratiform regions are governed by different physical processes. And I'm here showing just uh, two examples of why that is important. And so on the left side, this is a, a plot from um, one of Bob Howes's papers. And after that, I will um, cite Bob House a lot in this presentation, not just because he did a lot of groundbreaking work on stratiform convective separation, but also because he was my PhD supervisor a few years ago, back when I was in Seattle. And so this plot shows that the heating rate in convective regions is quite different from the heating rate in the stratiform regions. And the same goes for divergence on the bottom of this plot. Another um, example why we want to distinguish these ecotypes is if we want to calculate the precipitation rate from radar reflectivity. So we have an equation that looks something like this. So R is the rain rate, and Z is the radar reflectivity. And then there are these uh, parameters A and B. And they are usually chosen differently for convective versus stratiform radar echoes. So that's another reason why it's important to have that information available. So let's talk about uh, terminology a little bit. So um, we all use the terms convective and stratiform, and we kind of know what we mean when we say those. We use them for clouds, and we use them for precipitation. But um, as those of you uh, know who develop algorithms, if you want to teach an algorithm to do something, you need to be very clear what, you, what it is that you want the algorithm to do. So you need to have a very clear image for yourself. And so what I did was I looked at definitions of stratiform and, con and convective. So I wanted to know what I'm trying to, to do. And so first I looked at the AMS glossary, and I found stratiform. And stratiform says it's descriptive of clouds of extensive horizontal development as contrasted to the vertically developed cumuliform types. And then I wanted to look up convective, but there is no convectives. There's only convective cloud. 
And that's just a cloud that owes its uh, vertical development and possibly its origin to convection. And so I just want to point to these two terms, horizontal and vertical. I also looked at this uh, work by Howard from 1803 um, on the modifications of clouds, and he describes the stratus clouds as a widely extended continuous horizontal sheet. And the cumulus, so the convective type cloud, as a convex or conical heaps increasing upward from a horizontal base. So again, we have this horizontal versus vertical um, structure. But if you look closely in the AMS glossary definition here, we are talking about clouds um, and not precipitation. But then when you actually look at how um, radar echo classification algorithms are generally used, they are mostly used in precipitation studies. And so I looked if I could find something on the terminology on precipitation. And again, I looked at Bob's work, um, his uh, 2007 paper, and then his uh, book, Cloud Dynamics. And he talks about stratiform precipitation, and he says it comes from nimble stratus clouds. And he points out that it's related to weak vertical air motion. Um, while convective precipitation comes from active cumulus and cumulonimbus clouds, um, which is associated with strong vertical air motion and buoyantly unstable conditions. So again, um, vertical versus horizontal. And then Bob in his book also has this nice uh, conceptual model of the life cycle of convection. And so he, and this is really as it is observed in um, radar images. And so he describes this as when you look at this boundary that distinguishes between the light blue and the white regions, this is what a precipitation radar would see. So a precipitation radar would not see that cloud here. You, you would need a cloud radar for that. And so in the early stages, when there's still active um, convection, um, we have these uh, high reflectivity cores um, that, again, um, are, have this uh, vertical structure. And then as the convection ages, um, a stratiform region forms. And in the radar EQ, you would see the radar bright band in the stratiform region. And then it, at the end of the life cycle, um, the convective cores dissipate, and only the stratiform echo is left. So let's look at existing um, algorithms. And there are many. And most of them actually make use of that vertical versus horizontal structure that you can see in the radar echoes. And one algorithm is kind of the grandfather of classification algorithms, which was developed by um, our own Matthias Steiner, together with Bob House again and Sandra Jutta in 1995. And you can see this uh, image from their paper here. And so there's, it's, it's a bit dark, but there's a um, vertical cross section here through this mesoscale convective system, which shows that, um, again, vertical convective um, cell. And then in the trailing stratiform region, you have that horizontally layered um, bright band. And the algorithm does um, a nice job of, of finding that convective cell and identifying the stratiform regions here in green. Another algorithm that has been used extensively is the one that was originally developed for the trim precipitation radar. And I used that extensively during my PhD work. And it's also now used on, on the GPM uh, radars. And again, they make use of what they call the vertical method and the horizontal method. So they have a part of the algorithm that uh, does bright band detection and also some reflectivity thresholding. And then they test each uh, radar pixel um, against the surrounding um, radar pixels um, on the in the horizontal method. And then they combine them and come up with these three um, classifications, stratiform, convective, and other. And 
You can see here, this is a cross section through again, a mesoscale convective system, and you can see this nice convective pore with the trailing stratiform region. And so uh, the trim algorithm or GPM algorithm does a nice job of um, separating these two ecotypes. So as I said, there are many classification algorithms, and what they provide is generally a qualitative ecotype classification, like the GPM one, stratiform, convective, other, and sometimes some subcategories. Um, they provide these classifications on the horizontal dimensions, and that means that each classification um, stands for the whole vertical data column. And most of these algorithms were um, developed for specific applications of for specific um, climatic regions or specific to answer specific questions or for specific radar types or even sometimes very specific radars. And because they were developed for these specific cases, they are generally not that easy to tune if you want to use them on a different case. And some of them are not even published. So mostly there are papers that are published, but the algorithms themselves are, um, are quite often not available. So our goal was to develop yet another convective stratiform uh, classification algorithm. And here's what we want this algorithm to do. So we, we wanted to provide a traditional qualitative classification but we also want to see if we can get some quantitative um, information. And we wanted to provide vertically resolved information instead of having just one classification for the whole vertical column. Of course, the algorithm should be accurate and it should uh, easily adapt to different data sets and different types of radars. We want to make it open source, and ideally it would be easy to use. And so we came up with um, the ECHO algorithm, and as Jackie already mentioned, ECHO stands for ECHO classification from convectivity. So um, a little bit about the data that we used to develop this algorithm. So we used um, the 3D radar grid uh, collected during the pecan field campaign. PECAN took place in the summer of 2015 over the U.S. Great Plains, and the data set consists of 19 NEXRED radars, and you can see here this is just total accumulated precipitation from that radar grid. And so we used the 3D multi-radar multi-sensor MRMS grid, and it has a horizontal resolution of 0 0.01 degree and 33 vertical levels. But as I said, we want this algorithm to be adaptable to different types of radars. So we also used a vertically pointing radar. And obviously, we used our own hypercloud radar, which EOL deploys on the G5 aircraft in an underwing pod, as you can see here. Um, HCR is a W-band cloud radar. And it has Doppler and dual polarization capabilities. Um, the range resolution is 20 meters, and we provide it on a 10 hertz time resolution, which at typical ground speeds of the aircraft gives us a nice 20 by 20 meter uh, grid box. HCR can be operated in steering mode, so either pointing up or down, or it can scan perpendicular to the aircraft. And here on the right, I'm just showing waveguides of different types of radars. So here on the left, this S-band uh, radar, that's what the next red MRMS grid, I just talked about it, uh, uses. So that's a precipitation radar. And then all the way to the right here, that's the tiny little waveguide of a W-band radar, such as HCR, and which is um, a cloud radar. So what we want to do is, as I talked about extensively, is this vertical structure versus horizontally layered structure. So we want to figure out, well, is are the radar echoes more horizontally layered or are they more vertically aligned? So what we want to do is measure the homogeneity or heterogeneity on the horizontal axis. And the image I'm showing here is from the hypercloud radar. So you can imagine the aircraft flying up here at the top. 
and the, the radar is pointing down and is, is giving us a vertical slice through these uh, cloud and precipitation systems. And so we have this um, um, anvil cloud here on the top from a nearby mesoscale convective system, and then we have newly developing convective cells underneath. And so what we want to do is step through each of these radar grid points and figure out the homogeneity on the horizontal axis. So the way we do that is, so for example, for this point, we define a line on the horizontal dimension, and along that line, we calculate something that we call reflectivity texture. But before we do that, I would like to point out that we want to calculate the texture or the variability of the radar echo that is due to the variability in, in the convective feature, but not necessarily the gradient. So what we do first is I'm showing here two example points. One is in the stratiform region, one is in the convective region. So in the stratiform region, I'm plotting here in blue the reflectivity along that line. And you can see that it has a slope. And the same goes for the convective case here. It also has a slope. And so the first thing we do is we subtract that slope. We calculate the fit. We subtract the fit. And then we add the mean back in to retain the strength of the echo. And once we do that, we are just left with the residuals plus the mean. And now we calculate reflectivity texture. And here is the equation for reflectivity texture. So we square that um, reflectivity, these reflectivity values that are corrected for the slope. Then we take the standard deviation and then we take the square root of that. And so the standard deviation gives us the variability or the homogeneity along that line, but the square retains the intensity. And so we have both of these measures. And if you look at these values that I calculate here at the bottom, so for this point, the reflectivity texture value would be 2.2. But for the convective point, it would be 8.6, so quite a bit higher. So now we, um, this is, was uh, for the vertical pointing radar, so now we go to the 3D grid of the MRMS case. And in that case, we, we do not use a line around a circle, but we, uh, a line around a point, but we use a circle, again, on the horizontal um, dimension. And instead of fitting a line, we fit a plane, so we have to go to one, one dimension up and subtract the slope of that plane. And again, we calculate reflectivity texture for each grid point in the whole 3D radar um, volume. And when we do that, uh, this is the result. So this on, on the bottom here is reflectivity texture, and you can see we do that in 3D. And the nice thing is when you look at reflectivity here, we have a stratiform um, area here with a bright band. And so these relatively high bright band values, they get suppressed in, um, in reflectivity texture. And so now really only the convective core stands out. And now we go one step further. Reflectivity texture has kind of um, arbitrary values, but we want to make this comparable for different applications. So we map um, reflectivity texture onto another um, variable which we call convectivity. And it's, it's a very simple linear transformation from, we say, well, reflectivity textures of 30 map onto one, and reflectivity textures of zero map onto zero. So in the end, we, we transfer this range of 0 to 30 in reflectivity texture to 0 to 1 in convectivity. And so now we have this quantitative um, measure of how convective or stratiform each grid point is. And it ranges from 0, which means 100% stratiform, to 1, which means 100% convective. So we are can check off two of our goals. First of all, we have quantitative information and we have it um, on a vertically resolved grid. But we also wanted a traditional qualitative classification. 
And that's actually really easy. Once we have um, convectivity, we simply threshold on convectivity and say, okay, everything that's less than 0.4 is stratiform, and everything that's more than 0.5 is convective, and everything in between we call mixed. And so that gives us a nice classification, uh, a qualitative classification that is similar to um, previous algorithms, but it is in 3D. So, so far, we have only used reflectivity, nothing else, just one variable. And we already have this uh, basic classification, which may be enough so for some applications. But since we have the vertically resolved information, we can now add temperature to get a, for a more refined classification. And there are several ways you can add um, temperature to, to the algorithm. You can use radiosons or a forecast or a reanalysis. Or you can just give it um, the altitude of the freezing level and divergence level in, in kilometers. And so let's just see what I mean with freezing and divergence level. So freezing level is obvious. That would be the zero um, degrees Celsius isotherm. And the divergence level we define as the negative 25 degree isotherm. And we look through the literature, and that's kind of where people say that these huge convective um, cells have uh, actually have that divergence. But that is a, a parameter and the algorithm that can be tuned up or down depending on, on your specific needs. So what we do now is the stratiform echo. We say everything below the freezing level is low stratiform. Everything above the divergence level is high stratiform. And everything in between is mid stratiform. And we do something similar with the convective um, echo. So if um, the uh, convective feature is mostly contained below the freezing level, we call it a shallow convective feature. If it reaches into that mid-region, it's a mid-convective feature. And if it reaches all the way above the divergence level, it's a deep convective feature. So to compare with previous algorithms and also for applications like um, precip uh, rate calculations, it would be still nice to get this um, one classification for the whole vertical column. So we want to collapse that 3D classification into a horizontal uh, 2D classification. And that's also a, a relatively simple step because obviously within the algorithm, these different classifications are, are, are represented by numbers. And if we pick these numbers in a, in a reasonable way, to, to um, collapse the vertical dimension, we simply take the maximum of these values for each vertical column. And so that gives us then this 2D horizontal, um, more traditional classification scheme that other algorithms provide. So we can check off another um, goal. Uh, we have the more traditional qualitative classification, but we do have it in 2D and also on the vertical dimension. So now the question is, uh, well, does this actually work? And I have to point out that there is not really an objective measure to, to judge that against, because there is no instrument that directly measures how convective something is. And radar is actually the best tool to, to do that. But there are thing, still a few things that we can do to assess the quality of this algorithm. And so one thing that we thought would be useful is to compare with lightning data. So we, um, again, for the whole Pecan field campaign, we downloaded the NLDN um, lightning observations. And this is an example here. So here you can see just one example plot where we have in color. Um, the different classifications, and then in black and with this going to white uh, scale, we have the lightning um, flashes, so the density of the lightning. And you can see here, it's hard to see, there's actually some red around here. So this is the one uh, deep convective feature that we have in this plot. And you can see that this is also the, the area where we go into the, the whites here. So we have the highest density. But of course, this is just one example. So these bar plots around here, they have actually 
all data from pecans, so from the whole one and a half months. And so if we just leaving the lightning aside for now, if we look at this top plot here, we just see, well, how much area do we have in pecan in all these different categories? And as expected, um, we have mostly stratiform echo, as it should be, because again, it's horizontally spread out. And, but then if we look at the um, lightning flashes per category, um, we see that actually now the mid and especially the deep convective features dominate. And especially when we go to flashes per area, we see that, wow, almost everything is in the deep convective category. We can just look at the um, convective focus on the convective classifications. We see here just the number of features. We have mostly uh, mid-convective and um, shallow convective features. Deep convective are, are rather rare. But then we look at, again, we look at flashes per feature, and we see that by far the uh, deep convective category dominates. And also when we look at which percentage of features does have some lightning, we see that 70% um, of deep convective features have lightning, but only like 30% of the mid-convective features. So that all um, points in the right direction. Another thing that we can do is uh, to compare with other algorithms. And there was a reason I introduced the GPM, a trim and GPM algorithm. And so we downloaded all the GPM swaths for pecan again. And here I'm showing that same swath that I showed earlier. But now we run our echo algorithm on GPM and we run it on the MRMS grid. So we have two different radars, two different grids, but the same algorithm running on both. And you can see, well, obviously MRMS captures the, the whole mesoscale convective system and um, GPM only this little piece of it. But you can see that they actually um, are quite comparable. And then when we run ECHO, we can see also the classifications look um, quite nice and, and similar. And we have that uh, deep convective core identified both in GPM and in the MRMS grid. But to validate our algorithm, we want to compare with the actual GPM original um, uh, classification, which is here at the bottom. So when we look at our classification from ECHO and then at the GPM one, we see that the, um, they are similar, but our algorithm spreads the convective features out a little bit in space. And I have to say, we could tune our algorithm to make them tighter and make them more comparable. We chose not to because we thought that this is actually um, a, val a valid way of running the algorithm. But yeah, again, this was just one case. And now we want to look at the whole pecan data set. And so what we did is we looked at the original GPM classification types. And then we see if we pick all GPM stratiform echo points and see how our classification is distributed um, within over these points, we see that um, we have mostly stratiform and quite a bit of mixed echo. There's some convective um, echo, and that again speaks to that spreading out of the convective cores. When we look at the convective points, they are actually mostly in the convective categories. And then there are these other points. They can go either way, but they are mostly um, stratiform. So again, this is quite encouraging that our algorithm is, does comparably well to the well-established trim GPM algorithm. So we concluded, and also from looking at, I don't know how many thousands of images, um, we concluded that this algorithm actually works quite well. So now we want to know if it adapts to different data sets. And this is where um, Mike has all kinds of connections over the whole world to different radar groups. And so we got these nice um, 3D radar grids here, one from the UAE on the left side and one from Australia on the right side. And again, I, I like to show mesoscale convective systems with deep convective cores and trailing stratiform regions because that's 
where you really can see how such an algorithm works. And you can see um, ECHO does nicely in both cases. Here's another case, and that's the OPERA radar grid. So OPERA is the European radar grid, and unfortunately, they do not provide 3D information. They only give a horizontal 2D grid with um, maximum, so column maximum reflectivity. But since ECHO actually operates on the horizontal um, dimensions, we can still run it, even though this is just a 2D data set. And this is um, that case from 2021 where Germany and France, they had this catastrophic flooding with um, many people dying. And you can see that ECHO picks out the convective regions and the stratiform regions quite nicely. Okay, now we go again, we go back to the vertical pointing radars. And I already explained this uh, slide here. Um, for HCR. One thing that is different with HCR is when we think back about how Bob House defines stratiform versus convective precipitation, he pointed to the vertical air motion and how that is different in these different echo types. Well, and since HCR is a Doppler radar and measures um, radial velocity, meaning um, particle, vertical particle motion, we can make use of that. And so we don't have to rely on reflectivity alone, which is here in the top panel, but we can use radial velocity too. And so we calculate um, reflectivity texture, but then we also calculate velocity texture. And then we combine those two into convectivity. And what we found is that they actually really nicely complement each other. So they both pick out the convective cores, but within the stratiform cloud, um, the velocity really points to these smaller scale uh, convective features that are sometimes embedded in the clouds. So we, we found it quite beneficial to use both of these variables. And again, we, we go through the same steps. We threshold convectivity into the basic convective stratiform classification, and then we add temperature information um, to come to our advanced classification. And this, this image here really shows why it is so important to have vertically um, resolved information. Because if you have, like in this case, convective cells underneath a stratiform cloud, and you just have to pick one classification for the whole vertical column, you have to choose which one do you pick. And this is actually what this line at the bottom here shows it's this collapsing of the vertical dimension. But you can see here, yeah, we picked the convective one, but the stratiform cloud is, is lost. So you're really losing information if you have to choose. Um, again, we want to see if this vertical implementation um, of ECHO, which we call ECHO-V, if that works for different types of radars. So we used it on the Spaceborne CloudSat, cloud profiling radar. And actually, the CloudSat radar, they have a classification algorithm as well. Here at the very bottom, this line, again, it's just one classification for the whole vertical column. And this is what they provide. And you can see that there is some overlap. There are some differences. But overall, they, they agree, agree um, quite nicely, too. We also applied it to a ground-based vertical pointing radar. And that was interesting because here we have a very different time scale. So these are, um, this is actually um, almost an hour of data here. Well, you have, because if you have a ground-based radar, you have to wait until the system passes over the radar. You can't just slice through it like with an aircraft or a satellite. And so you have to tune the algorithm um, that it takes the right length of that horizontal line. But once you do that, you actually get um, nice results as well. So I hope I have convinced you that this adapts to very different circumstances and different data sets. It is open source. Um, it is released in LROS, so um, the LIDAR radar open software environment that um, Mike Dixon, together with uh, Michael Bell from CSU, um, 
so they, they are the PIs of, of LROs. And so we can check the open source box. And then, the, yeah, is it easy to use? Uh, we would say yes. We applied it to all these different data sets, but I'm hoping that um, you will download that algorithm through LROs and try it out yourself. That's why there's a question mark there, because you can answer that question yourself. So those are the conclusions for that part of my presentation. It's the longer part. Um, and so we checked all these boxes. We, we developed this algorithm that fulfills these criteria, criteria that we laid out. And I just wanted to mention our two publications, one for the 3D implementation of ECHO and one for ECHO V for the vertically pointing radars that are both published in JTEC. So I was thinking about what can we do with this new classification algorithm. And I really wanted to, as I said, most applications focus on precipitation. And I really looking at, at all these cloud radar images from HCR, I really wanted to shift the focus a little bit to, to the clouds. And you can even see here in, in this image from CloudSet, you can see some gaps here it's, yeah, with the yellow color. It's hard to see, but they only classify when there is surface precipitation. So even though clouds, the clouds at CPR is a cloud radar, even they focus only on the precipitation. But I really wanted to look into the cloud part. And so I was wondering, well, can we use that for a cloud classification scheme? And yes, we can, because I did. And so I, I used that information to come up with my own classification scheme. And I, I, I'm not going to go into the details. I only have like five minutes left. But I differentiated between um, precipitating and non-precipitating clouds. And then again, I divided them in these three levels of the atmosphere, below the freezing level, above the divergence level, and in between. And so we have purely stratiform clouds. We have purely convective clouds, and we have these mixed, which I call constrat clouds. And then those that are just called cloud, those are the non-precipitating one. And then we can calculate different cloud properties once we have these different cloud classes. And this is just an example. So I used all of our HCR field campaign data, and they were collected in very different locations. We had a field campaign in the tropics, one over the southern ocean, one in the subtropics. But if you have these cloud classes from the same radar, you can actually compare them over these different regions of the world. And here's just one example where I was looking at precipitation shafts from these clouds. And you can see here we have the convective clouds, the convective shallow, then the mixed shallow, and then the stratiform shallow. And when we just look at the mean reflectivity of the precipitation, we see that it decreases from the more convective to the more stratiform types. And also, when we look at fall speed of the precipitation, it also decreases um, from the convective to the stratiform type. So you can, this is just an example of what one could do. Um, another example here is um, when we look at the tropical field campaign o track you can see here it took place over the um, Pacific and the Caribbean Ocean. And we look here on the left, we have shallow clouds. And the shallow clouds, they develop mostly over this region here, which when we look at sea surface temperatures, these are the flight paths of the aircraft with sea surface temperature and color. You can see the shallow clouds, they develop mostly over this region with colder sea surface temperature. But then when we look where the mid-level clouds occur and then also the deep-level clouds, they occur mostly over the warmer regions. And again, we can calculate some cloud properties. And this plot here shows the um, cloud top of the shallow clouds. So not the mid or deep ones, just the shallow clouds. But we can see that already at the shallow stage, over these warmer regions, they are deeper than over the cooler regions here. And then when we look at mean convectivity, we can also see higher values in the warmer regions as opposed to these um, 
less convective cooler regions. And also at the mean upward motion in these clouds, we, we see the same thing. So we can conclude that convectivity and updraft speed um, seem to be associated with um, the ability of shallow clouds to develop into deeper clouds. But the, yeah, those are just examples and I'm currently finishing up a, a publication where you can read more on, on that. But I just wanted to give these examples of what could be done with these classifications. Other ideas are, well, can we actually use um, convectivity and relate that to heating rate? Because convectivity, again, is this quantitative measure where previously we only had a qualitative measure. The question is, does this quantitatively compare to the heating rate or the, to the divergence? And also when we calculate rain rates, these A and B parameters, can we modify them based on the quantity of convectivity instead of just using convective or stratiform and nothing in between? So those are um, things we would like to explore. Another possible application is um, storm tracking. And there are a lot of storm tracking algorithms. One of them is Titan that has been used for I don't know how many decades. And what it does, it, it tracks convective cores. But if, and these convective cores are um, defined by a reflectivity threshold. But if you use a reflectivity threshold, if you have a really strong bright band, that can give you a false identification if you rely on that threshold. But if we think of convectivity, which actually lowers the value in the bright band, we could use maybe convectivity instead of reflectivity um, for these storm tracking uh, purposes. So we would hopefully get less of these false um, um, bright band identifications. So here are my conclusions of that second part. So this convective stratiform ecotype can be useful for cloud classifications. And then the cloud properties that um, can be calculated from these different cloud classes um, provide insights into the cloud dynamics. Um, and there are other possible uses like for the heating rate or precipitation rate calculations or for storm tracking. And here are my final thoughts and questions. And one is, is convectivity a useful quantity? So we came up with that concept. Convectivity is actually not a real word yet. So when you type it in, you get this squiggly red line because it's, it's not in the dictionary yet. Hopefully it will be at, at some point. And so it would be nice to evaluate if that's actually a, a good quantity. And I would also like it see clarify what we mean when we talk about convective versus stratiform to have a more clearly defined um, boundary of what that actually means. And maybe we can also use that uh, to unify the convective stratiform concept for precipitation and clouds, because right now they're kind of treated separately. Actually, for the cloud case, they're not treated at all. We just use them and say, oh, this is a convective cloud, but no one really, really does anything with that. So these are my final thoughts, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and answer your questions. And this is just another case from the MRMS grid for the whole United States. And in this case, it's over the East Coast where we have this huge squall line. And you can really see here when this is the bright band, it's very bright. <laughs> So if you're a forecast and you, you see that, it's kind of hard to see, well, where's actually the convective action happening? But then when you look at our echo classification, it clearly um, points out where the convective uh, squall line is, and you're not getting distracted by the, um, by the bright band region. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Larika. That was like an excellent overview on the distinction between cumulus and stratiform clouds, um, and also a wonderful introduction, an advertisement for um, your innovative 
um, algorithm. I can imagine that this would be really useful for modelers, particularly the cloud classification, especially for climate modelers, where clouds are very complex. And they and all modelers want to linearize absolutely everything. So I could see how that would be <laughs> quite useful in that realm. Um, we have plenty of time for questions in the audience or online. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Romachka? Yeah, that, was, that was very nice, Ricky. Thanks for presenting that stuff. Um, so I think it's a, I'll just go off my question just a little bit. I don't know if there ever will be a really distinct boundary between stratiform and convection because there's some kind of a, there's a transition sometimes. So that was just a thought. So my question is, so many times in stratiform there will be embedded convection. And so how do, and obviously at some point then you have to come back, classify that as convection, I suppose. So how, how do you feel your algorithm addresses uh, uh, you know, convection, small convection that's embedded in stratiform. Yeah, obviously it's perfect. It is. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, <laughs> yeah, and that was especially uh, looking at the images from the cloud radar, and that was actually where most of my question came came up. Well, what do I want to identify? Because when you look at clouds. Um, you not only get some embedded convection starting from the ground, but you get these convective features high up. And that's why I didn't even mention that we have an elevated convective feature category because I, I wanted to point these out. Here is, there is something happening within that stratiform cloud that may be of interest. And it's really, yeah, when, when you tune the algorithm, it's like, okay, what do I want to tune it to? How much of that do I want to pick up? And yeah, and then that really brought it home for me that we, we don't really have an objective way of saying, okay, this is convective versus this is stratiform. Can I ask one more? And, and so as you very well know, we have a, um, a particle, particle classification scheme on SPOL and that hasn't been improved for a long time. Is there any possibility of integrating some of that information into that uh, particle ID type of a thing to give, because that, that's what would be really nice. We could you know, upgrade SPOL to having all these additional classifications that might spur interest of uh, users of SPOL. Yeah, and again, going back to HCR, we, as you know, we also have a particle ID algorithm for HCR. And I actually do use the convective stratiform um, echo type information in the HCR PID. So there is definitely potential to do that. And with PID, it's even, it's even harder to validate <laughs> because you really, yeah, it, it's hard to, to find any data. But yeah, that's definitely a, a possibility. But of course, it, it can go both ways. You could also use PID to improve the convective stratiform classification. And so it's always which, which direction do you pick because you, you can only do, do it one way. Otherwise, you're kind of um, using the same information twice. Does anybody have any questions? Anyone online? Thanks, Ricky. That was really good presentation. Great work. Um, my question was about the elevated convection that you actually mentioned in response to John's question. Can you? So you're defining it as embedded convection that's within the stratiform region. Is that what you say is elevated convection? So our definition is. Well, I mean, we just we just threshold on convectivity. So sometimes we get a feature that is identified as convective, but it's not close to the ground. And that's basically how it is defined. We, are, we find high convectivity values, but they don't start near the ground. And actually, we, I, I know for pecan, that was actually of the main 
of the main purposes of Bicon was to find elevated convection. In our paper, we have a case where it actually does find one of these um, cases of elevated convection that have been identified in the literature, and we see that with our echo algorithm. But then also we have elevated convective features that, yeah, some of them, I'm, I'm not sure, are true elevated convection. And that's why we, I don't call them elevated convection, but elevated convective features. <laughs> okay, Can, could you go back to the HCR example where you separate it out into elevated? Um, I don't, yeah, maybe the other one, the other example that you showed later. Yeah. So those pink regions are being identified as elevated. So some of them are closer to the ground than others. So it's kind of a fuzzy definition maybe. Yeah, and, and this is the, um, the cloud set um, algorithm. So I, I didn't spend a huge amount of tuning time on that algorithm. So for that specific um, application, I'm ignoring these. <laughs> I'm not really adding any significance to them. Whereas, and I have to say that uh, the CloudSat application, it does not use um, radial velocity. This is purely reflectivity. And that's why I said for HCR, these things, they actually, when you look, when you zoom into the radial velocity, you can see there are up and downward motion. So there is actually vertical motion going on. For the cloud set, I, I was actually thinking about spending more time on that and actually maybe pitching it to the cloud set people to use. But yeah, I, I didn't, it, it's not as well tuned. Yeah, I can answer a little bit, Tammy, on the, for the 3D grid. You know, sometimes if, you know, at far range, you can get an elevated feature that is just all you're seeing is the top. But so, so for the 3D one, we only call it elevated if there's mixed or stratiform below it. So, you know, so if you, yeah, it, for example, if all you see is, you know, the pink, or you would see the pink, but there's nothing underneath it, then we wouldn't indicate it as elevated. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, the fellow who was responding in the yellow t-shirt is Mike Dixon, who is the second author on this um, presentation. Um, I hope you don't mind if I ask two questions, actually. So if you go back to the final slide with the, um, the loop, um, so with regards to um, cell tracking, uh, implementing this into Titan, I'm immediately drawn to areas over Georgia where your classification seems to flicker in time. I'm wondering if there's any sort of consistency temporally that should be implemented, or if that's a, a feature rather than a bug. <laughs> um, so when you... When you say flickering, most of the flickering that you see is, is a mid-convective feature switching to deep or shallow convective features switching to mid at one time step. And of course you can debate, well, I mean, that, that's just how it is. I mean, they grow and they reach a certain level and then they dissipate again. And so they may just reach that stage at one specific time step. And I don't think we would take that, we would want to take that away. Of course, sometimes you also see something identified in only one time step where there's a little, you know, some artifact in the algorithm where suddenly you have a convective thing within a stratiform region that maybe shouldn't be there. And yeah, we will, when we get to the stage where we implement it in Titan, we'll have to think about how to deal with that. Gotcha. And then my second question was um, for environments where you might have really high shear, um, do you find that there might be mis, uh, 
misrepresentation of deep convection because the updraft might be tilted? So that's actually the nice thing about having the 3D information because um, we look for these connected convective features and even when they're tilted, they're usually still connected. Okay. So you, you find them. But then of course, if you collapse them into the 2D field and take the maximum over the whole column, that will make them bigger horizontally speaking than they actually are. And that really shows that you should use the 3D information. Gotcha, thanks. No questions online. Any further questions from the audience? Yeah, from this side of the audience. This is great. Um, this is the first time I've seen this stuff, so thanks. It was really cool. Um, clearly, I'm not probably around here as much. So my question is sort of following up on the last question, but and, and your answer to the last question, where the method that you use to collapse is just this maximum. How straightforward, it seems like it would probably pretty, be fairly straightforward for someone to take, for basically different users to take the 3D grid and collapse it in different ways that suits their needs. Um, would, that, would that be recommended? How, how easy do you think that would be to do? Um, Let me just go back to that slide where we do that here. Yeah, so that is actually the intention that that is something the users can choose. And, and so we thought about, what we thought about mostly here is, well, how do we distribute these numbers? Which one is the one that we want to retain? And it was clearly, well, deep convection, that's actually, that's a main thing. So that should be at the top. And so we thought, yeah, the convective ones should be at the top. And then the, the biggest question was where, where does elevated convective go? <laughs> And there may be a case that if you don't trust that part as much, like I said, for the cloud side case, maybe you want to put it lower down. Um, but yeah, this is what we found useful. But it's really simple to rearrange these numbers in, in any way you want. But if you look at, at here, for example, if you put Stratiform at the top, then you will get rid of almost all of this convective cell here. And so you probably wouldn't want to do that. I'm almost envisioning like a fractional contribution where like whatever has the highest fraction of the column is your thing. At least that's my personal. Yeah, and that is actually out of my personal interest. <laughs> that is actually one thing I did yeah. for for HCR at some point. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and I tried it out, and yeah, you can do that, and it is easy to do. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Just a follow on to um, the last person's question. So these, um, these results can be exported to a NetCDF for a text file so that you can do your own additional research with it. So all of our radar data and all radar data should be in CF radial. And actually the WMO just adopted CF radial too as the format for radar data that should be used uh, worldwide. That is a net CDF file type. And so echo reads in net CDF or CF radial and it writes out CF radial. So this is all in net CDF and therefore very easy to further um, process. And we have a question online from Andy who asks, um, Stratiform clouds rarely have reflectivity above 30 dBz above the ML at X-band. Wouldn't that be enough to classify Stratiform versus convection in the vertical? And, and then there's another question that may, might be tied into it. And W-band above 18 dBz for convection. So it is true that you have an upper limit of reflectivity in shorter wavelength radars. However, that also applies to the bright band region. And so that problem that the bright band, um, if you just use reflectivity, you will run into that problem that you misidentify bright band regions as convective regions. And that doesn't go away by using a um, smaller wavelength radar. 
because we see that even in HCR, you get high reflectivity values in the bright band. And we have another question um, online from Hugh Morrison, who asks, sorry if I missed this, but have you thought about applying this algorithm to model data, example, reflectivity for a direct observ OBS model comparison? Would this be straightforward to do? Yes, and actually, um, Kristen Rasmussen from CSU, she has done that. She ran ECHO on WARF output, and she said it was easy to do. <laughs> I think Mike helped her set it up. And so, yeah, we have an application that runs on WARF, but we haven't evaluated it um, ourselves. Well, we are just past our seminar, so if you're interested in um, the research that's happening with um, Ulrika and Mike with the ECHO algorithm, or you want to incorporate it in your models, please get in touch with them. Visit them at EOL or get, contact them via email. So let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.